What I have here is something that feeds the majority of the world. It's wheat. Whole kernel. Wheat. Something you can buy ground up in the store for pennies. Have you any idea what percentage of nutrients are lost within 24 hours after this is cracked? How much vitamin content it loses? Maybe you do. Maybe you buy it this way. Maybe you grow your own. But then what? You have to mill it. So how do you do that? Well, currently, well, currently, your only options are something like this. What happens when you're in the middle of milling your own grain and this happens? Oh, man! What recourse do you have? My next guest has an absolute passion for mills. He's fixed them, he's restored them, he's built them, and he's working on a project that might save your life. Have you been told you have a gluten allergy? Do you really? Are you allergic to the poison that they spray on these? We'll find out. So please welcome my next guest on this fourth episode of our Flannel Farms Forum. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of what we like to call our Flannel Farms Forum. Today, I have Justin Metcalf, or Jouston, I think it is, depending on which video you're watching, um, from Metcalf Mills. From, from what I understand, he's a seventh generation farmer. He's a mill enthusiast, if not expert, and has two kids and has been farming the same land for seven generations. And I, I just think that is the coolest thing that you guys have somehow in this crazy society maintained seven generations in, in one area. Your, your area, uh, is it, I guess, tell me about your land. Tell me about your family's land. How, how much do you guys have between y'all and, and kind of give us your story. Tell us what you're about. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's Justro. I go by Justro. Justro. My, Justro. My mom uh, <laughs> nicknamed me that and she passed away last year. And I thought, well, this might be a good way to keep her, her nickname going because she's the only one that ever called me that. So, yeah, we've been here since uh, early 1800s. I think I'm eighth generation, actually. And uh, there was thousands of acres in the beginning, but they had big families and it's got broken up. So our, our place here is about 50 acres. And that's plenty enough to, you never run out of anything you need to do. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Yeah. But yeah, I grow some heirloom corn and I'm starting to grow some small grains. I've got a small patch of red cloth and wheat that I was able to, first of all, find out the name of it and then get the seed of that, which is a very small amount. But this is what the wheat that my grandparents grew 100 years ago. And I was really excited to grow that. That is really neat to have that connection to what they were doing. And I think it's it's part of the problem with our society today is, is we've uncoupled from the things that matter and you know church family and those kind of things even even careers to an extent doing the same thing that your family you know has has done passes on generational knowledge that uh, e even if you try and show it on youtube it's not the same as as having grown up with with the old hands doing it right right so Tell us about mills, because this seems to be your your uh, your forte, kind of your your niche, if you will, in, in this area. What are what got you into mills? Okay, uh, I grew up listening to stories from my dad. My grandpa ran a small community grist mill when my dad was very young, and I grew up listening to stories from my dad about going to the mill, and he had so much joy when he talked about that, and you know he he would tell me uh, I would just a small boy and I'd be walking around and I would uh, go over to the grist mill working and stick my hand under the spout and the corn mill was coming out and it was kind of hot warm and he said he would eat it right out of his hand and how good it was and how good it smelled and he just kind of instilled 
I guess you'd say a love in me for milling. And when I was 14, my grandpa still had that little, that little grist mill, little 16 inch Meta's stone mill, but it, the wood had rotted on the bottom. And I had a sawmill man mill the lumber I needed. And I restocked this mill completely when I was 15 years old. I didn't really have any help from anybody. Just I loved woodworking and was excited about it. And I had to learn how to put this thing together pretty much on my own. And there was an, uh, an old miller in our county here that I'd met. And he, he told me what he knew about dressing millstones. And we got I got this thing working and started milling corn when I was 15. And I remember when I, the first time me and my dad milled some corn and I, I, had, I got a bag of cornmeal. I scooped up a bag of the cornmeal and I took off running and went all the way to my grandpa's house and and I showed him this bike and you know his little mill that hadn't been working in 50 years was now milling corn again and it, we were all really excited about that and I've loved it ever since. Since then I got into construction for the first public job I had and then started my own business four years later and it just kind of came back to uh the mill right part of it and I had to learn a lot but I had the opportunity in 2013 to build a water-powered grist mill from the ground up wow and that was a dream come true because you know I always liked playing in the stream playing in the creek and I built some small water wheels growing up and to get to do this life-size working machine was just a dream come true and that that got really is what got me back in to my my meals and whatnot and since then i've done a lot of restorations on some old meals some as old as 150 years old talking about just the machine that does the grinding and i built some other water wheels that, that work and now i've been for about a little over 10 years i've had the idea and been thinking about it and dreaming about it of of creating my own grain mill, stone mill, and it'll be a machine, like I build a machine here at my shop, and then it can go wherever and be able to mill grain for whoever. It'd be a, you know, it's going to be, like my plan is two sizes of that machine, a small one and a larger one at first, and the small one will be a size that could be used as a household meal or a small community meal and the bigger one maybe for a bakery or a business or a, or a larger community but uh like i said i've had that dream kind of for 10 years and i've been thinking about it very often and and trying to figure out all the details and how i want everything to work and how i want it to look and i'm trying to apply what i've learned in my my meal right trade to put that into this grain mill because if I'm working on a an old grain mill that was built 150 years ago and it still works perfectly you know there's something right absolutely so I'm gonna apply what I've learned and what I've seen that has held up and I'm gonna try to make uh, a first class top quality stone grain mill there's nothing like it offered right now, and it's going to be very versatile as long as your power source. If you buy a grain mill today, it's going to be very expensive, and you're only going to have one option as to how to power that. That's an electric motor. My mill, there'll be a lot of different options, and it'll be easy to implement whatever power source you have, whether it be a stream for a water wheel, an old engine, an old tractor. Uh, you know, just whatever you've got. And I'm working on some other ideas that uh, once I get farther along with, I'll talk about, but I'm trying to meet the need and, and raise awareness as far as the health benefits of freshly milled grains. Absolutely. I, I think in, in many ways, what you're doing is, is vital in Currently, there, like you said, there's there's one option for almost everything, and we, we have a plethora of things that we can buy. 
And I think it was Billy right. from Pastures who said, you know, we, we know the cost of everything and the value of nothing. And, you know, it, it's hard to explain to people when you can just go to the grocery store and buy food, whether it's, you know, flour that's ground up or, or pre-made bread or your chicken or anything, why it is valuable to make your own things and why it is valuable to, to kind of decouple from these um, big institutional type facilities. And they have their place. I'm, I'm glad they exist. We have been able to create food very cheaply for a huge number of people. But one of the benefits of, of having and living in a successful country and, and neighborhoods is that we can start to focus back on things that matter, like heritage breeds, um, like doing things yourself. And I think we, we have all seen how fragile things are getting. And a lot of times, if, if, an, um, if, uh, if something applies to your household, if, if a methodology applies to your household, you can apply it to a government or a country. So if all of your eggs are in one basket, which is an old saying for a reason, and that basket tumbles over, you're, you're done. And our country's eggs seem to be in, in one big basket. And I don't think, I think a lot of people's eyes have been opened in the past couple of years that one little thing in that stream and all those eggs are toast. So we need people to be able to know how to grind mills or, or grind their grain, make mills. We need people who know how to work with wood. We need people who know how to grow things. We need people who know animal husbandry, how to create food without, you know, massive amounts of fertilizer or huge machinery or these kind of things. These skills are dying. People will die for lack of knowledge. I mean, that's, that's a scriptural thing. You know, people die for lack of knowledge and it's true. I mean, most people have two to three days worth of food in their garage or their fridge or wherever, and they have no way to get more if things go bad. Well, I can grow grain in my front field, but if I can't do anything with it because there's no power, for example, there's no alternative. You know, I have an electric little grain mill that I put up on my property and you're in my, in my kitchen and I can grind my own stuff. But when the power goes out, that's, right. that's it. I'm, I'm done. So um, I'm, I'm very interested in what you're doing and potentially in the future, maybe being a, a um, prototype <laughs> type situation, because I'm interested in one that we could use maybe animals with, you know, or, or human power, even walk in a circle, something like that, something that size that if all else fails, you know, when the tractors don't run because there's no diesel, you still have a plow, you still have a, a hand harrowing disc, you have those kind of things. So this is, this is really important what you're doing. And I think people will realize it more as time goes on. We just, I just hope you're not too late for, for some of those people. Same here. I do too. I tell you, it's, I feel like it's, you know, like I said, I've been wanting to start this for over 10 years and it just seems like now's the time and everything's falling into place for that. So, right. Sorry, I have somebody. I got to cut this out too. Um, I have somebody coming over later, <laughs> and they're asking me a question. I understand. Yeah, man, it's 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 been nonstop. Okay, I hear you. I, I normally don't even have my phone, but I have all the notes I wrote on it to ask you here. So I wanted to make sure I I had uh, had some things going on. Um. So. You, you say you've, you've been thinking about it for 10 years. You got the idea kind of kind of solidified. And, and are, you, are you working on a prototype now? And if so, how can we help? Yes, I am working on a prototype. And uh, what I've done is I have a kick starter going. It's going to be active for another two weeks from today. And that will get the whole project kicked off as far as upfront expenses and you know materials are expensive and different things and if I can you know purchase more up front then I'll get a better price on it and that's one of my goals is to try to keep the price of this grain meal as low as I can so people can afford it and if say one person can't really afford it Another thing that I want to try to encourage with this is community. So a community, if they go in together and get a grain meal, then everybody in the community can use that. That's, that's what I'm uh, trying to encourage as well. So, 
Do you have, I know it's very early in the, in the grand scheme of things, but do you have a price range that you're, that you're hoping to be in, or do you, you know, want to double that just to be on the safe side or like, what is, you know, you talking five grand, 10,000, 50,000, what's the, what's your price point, I guess, goal. I'm hoping yes or less. I'm hoping. How much? I'm sorry. Your first guess there around okay. 5k. I'm be less than that but i mean the thing about it is you can buy these little electric countertop mills but like you said if the if the power's off you can't do anything with that right and this is a real own grain mill with granite stones and it's just, there's so much that has to go into it it's going to be very simple to use and very simple so that there's not parts that fail going to be really unlike anything else available right now just because of the way i'm going to do that and i'm hoping it's going to be one of those things that's around 100 years later and still working well and that's that's possible some some things are you know the the value in it is not monetary but even if you look at it from a monetary thing it's it you know how much is an heirloom worth you know when you got that mill growing for your grandfather that had run for God knows how many years before, and it still sat there. And with a little bit of repair and some sweat equity, it was back up and running, you know, two, three generations later. How much is that worth? Exactly. Exactly. That is, and you know, go ahead. another thing is there's talking about being, having a centralized system there's no understanding there. I mean, people buy a bag of white flour out of the grocery store. They open the bag and scoop out two or three or four cups, whatever they need. They have no idea of what it is or where it came from. Right. And that leads on to the value of milling grains fresh. A grain is like a little capsule. And once that capsule is broken, it starts like everything else. Like when you cut an apple, you know, it starts deteriorating and going downhill fast it's the same with a grain in 24 hours you've lost like four. another call <laughs> busy man <laughs> it's the same with a grain 24 hours you've lost 40 percent of your vitamin content of that grain wow another two or three days you've lost 85 or 90 percent that's why it's so important to have a freshly milled grain to eat and, you know, make things out of. And the flavor, once you experience that fresh flavor, there's no going back. You don't know what you've been eating. I got a call from a lady down in Texas a couple of weeks ago, and she was uh, telling me about her and her kids living in an apartment in Waco, and they were having some health problems. And she started researching food and she ordered her a little countertop grain meal uh, and she ordered a bucket of wheat berries, organic wheat berries, I think it was. And she started grinding this wheat and making their bread fresh. And she said her words were that healed us. She said it healed their health problems. She makes fresh bread and gives it away and she was telling me she wished she had some kind of a freezer situation so she could make bread and put it in the freezer and have it on hand but it just really touched me and hearing her talk about how this had helped her it just like inspired me to do as much as I can as fast as I can and I think it's also cognitive function is a lot better if you're getting these whole grain vitamins, like, I mean, that's what we're supposed to be eating. Right. When they started commercializing grain, okay, so if you got a centralized system, the only way that's gonna work is if this product stays intact long enough to get it to whoever's gonna buy it last. So when they were all excited about making white flour, they stripped away all the bran, all the, the germ, all the whole grain goodness was stripped away and all you've got left is the endosperm. And then they have to enrich it, which is add stuff back to it that was originally there, their own version of it. And who knows what all that consists of. So now you've got a, something you can put in a bag and it's gonna lay there for months and somebody can buy it and eat it later on down the road. That's not how it's supposed to be. 
you know, people, a big thing right now is gluten allergies. Mm -hmm. I've talked to many people that once they started eating organic grains, freshly milled, they didn't have a gluten allergy to that. So then that brings you to think, well, what was it? Well, small grain crops, a lot of times, to my understanding, they spray that with Roundup or glyphosate to kill the crop so that it's easier to harvest and separate the grain from. Okay, so you're spraying your whole grain with poison. So it turns out maybe it's a alert allergy to poison, not to the gluten and the grain. It, you know, it, I, I consider myself to be uh, a very conservative type individual in, in, in all forms and fashions and politically speaking. And I remember probably 10 or 15 years ago, now I've, I've always wanted to, to live out in the country and, and, you know, kind of make my own food and do those kind of things. But I remember seeing, you know, from, from more liberal leaning publications, you know, decrying big pharma and big agriculture. And I thought, you know, they're, you know, crazy tree hugging, whatever, you know. Um, and it turns out, as a matter of fact, I was I was wrong in many of my own suppositions, and they they were right in many of theirs that it's it's not normal. These these aren't the best ways to do things. Now I don't ascribe you know spirituality to plants and animals and things, but God did create plants and animals to function in their way as they are designed to function, and we are we you know big agriculture, big big food is you know, not doing those things, not honoring the way that they were made. And I, I think Joe Salton right. says the, the pigness of the pig and the chickenness of the chicken. Well, that applies to your, your plants as well. We have, it's one thing to cross pollinate and make, you know, something that's a little hardier for your area. It's another thing to be in there tweaking things and then, you know, stripping everything out of it that's good and then adding your version of stuff back. And that that's not you know, grain isn't the only thing they do that to. All, all of our stuff, you know, they bathe our, our our meat in ammonia so that it's good for you. You know, it, and all these things are approved by the powers that be. So I, I think you're right. right. You look at the health situation of of the the fully developed countries. You know, we have all these crazy health problems because we're getting mass produced poison. And it's being passed off as food and stamped by the appropriate agency that says, oh, no, 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 this is good and healthy for you. And it's it, eight servings of grain, you know, but when they say, you know, carbohydrates, well, yes, if you're eating the right carbohydrates, not the stuff you get off the shelf. Uh, the Tudor, the Tudor right. time period is something I'm very interested in. And they would eat two pounds, like a two pound loaf of bread before they went to bed. Like that was dinner. And you think, how are wow. they not 700 pounds? Well, because they weren't eating two pounds of enriched whole white, you know, flat. They were they, something that was, that, like you said, milled that day or the day before. And you went home and you made it because it would go bad. So you made it, you baked it, you ate it, and you, you went about your day. So, uh, yeah, I think, I think you're right, especially on the health benefits and things like that. It's not just about, well, you can't go pop a multivitamin and, and get the same benefits that you're losing out of that wheat. Exactly. And another thing as far as the allergies. So if you eat, uh, if you eat wheat, and it's got poison in it, your body don't recognize the poison, it recognizes the grain, the wheat, and you're getting poison from it. So your body gives you a reaction to protect yourself. <laughs> but it's not the grain. It's the poison you're trying, it's trying to protect you from. It's just, you know, it's all mixed together. And yeah, if, if you know that, yeah, like you said, if your body recognizes one thing, then you reject anything associated with it because it's it's bad. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's your body functioning as designed the way it's supposed to protect you. And it's, then we just give you medicine. And that's also poison. Right. <laughs> right. So we're going to put a, a link to the to the Kickstarter here, I think, in the in the description to make sure people have access to it. So you just right. started on, on the YouTube, it seems like. I was, I was scrolling back through, and it's only been up for about a, about a year now. Is that right? A year and a half? Well, that's when I started the channel. My daughter encouraged me to start one, and uh, I, I kind of put two or three videos up and didn't do much with it, you know. And 
then my friends at Permapasture Farm, my neighbors, I met Billy and Michelle and William, and they were telling me about it. They said, you need to do this. And they helped tremendously to get it off the ground. And they, they uh, promoted me and mentioned me a lot. And William helped me with a lot of the details and editing at first and all that kind of thing and got me up and going. And I got into it like the first part of July of last year is when I really, really got into it. And it's been growing since then, but I didn't have very much on there at all before that. Yeah, I was, I was scrolling back through because I've, I've just found you too, actually, with the reason, um, one of the ways I found you is when, when I've been doing some of these interviews, I asked people for recommendations and I probably got 15 to 20 people that wanted to hear an interview with you and what you had to say. So I, who am I to, to argue with the people? But yeah, I've, I've been looking back and saw a few of your videos, um, the review on the doc, um, the, the tool, uh, I saw your uh, a brief picture of your mill that you had built because you had a kind of a short clip in there in one of your videos and it's it's really really informative and you you make the type of videos that while they might not have um, a huge mass appeal people like me who are who are looking for knowledge and looking for ways to do things who don't have seven or eight generations of farming background the stuff that you're doing is gold for people like me so you're you're doing good work and I personally appreciate it Thank you so much for saying that. It makes my day. I, that's what I always say. You know, I want to help somebody if I can. And if we can laugh a little bit during that time, great. If you enjoy watching what I do, you know, great. But I hope I can help most of all. And but the way my life has been, I know I'm realizing more and more all the time, a lot of people don't have any kind of uh, background like I do. And it Maybe hearing about mine, not bragging on myself, I was just blessed to be born where I was. I'm hoping sharing that with folks, it blesses them and helps them and maybe encourages them in some way. And from what people say, that's what's happening. And it really, it's really amazing how good it makes you feel to think, well, my life, you know, is, is blessing somebody and they're learning from that. And you know, I mean, I lived up in this holler all my life and, you know, you some, I guess you just get in a mindset, well, everybody else is just like us. Well, that ain't it at all. And you start sharing things and you get feedback from people. And every day I'm just amazed at what people say. And I mean, I could spend hours t talking about folks that have contacted me and shared their stories and it's just amazing. Yeah. We, uh, we just bought our land back August of last year, and we moved 60 miles away from, from where my, my current job is. And, you know, we're, we're basically posting, because I've talked about doing this for years, and we, we call it homesteading because we're just trying to feed ourselves currently. We don't produce anything for anybody else. And, uh, but for, for the past 10 or 15 years, we've been talking about it. And we've talked to so many people that are interested in doing it, but very few people have either had the means or the ability to kind of make that jump because things have gotten crazy expensive. And um, so the, the stuff that we put up is, if you've thought about it, here we are doing it. It's our first time planting bolt crops this year. It's our first time I'm gonna be butchering pigs here in, in two weeks, the first time we've ever done that. Three months ago, we harvested chickens for the first time. Like everything is for the first time. I've never operated a three-point tractor before. Now I own two of them, you know, and they're a, one's a 53 Ford Jubilee, one's a 1968 Ford 4000, you know, but it, it, it's so much fun. <laughs> it's so much fun. Yeah. working your land it's not about a dollar amount or the value in, in in money but eating your own food and and building something that works is it's way more satisfying to me than a certain amount of money in the bank or or a new car or it it's when your tractor breaks and you go fix it there's just something something about that so exactly no other feeling like it same yeah. with milling your own ground once you experience taking that grain, putting it in the hopper of a grain mill and seeing that product come out and taking it home and cooking it and eating it, some of the best thing you've ever tasted. It's, it's the same. I mean, it's just whether you're getting cornmeal, corn flour, corn grits, 
fine f fine whole grain wheat flour for making bread and all that stuff or, or you're cracking wheat one of our favorite things is if you separate the stones you can grind coarser you can like crack grains for chicken feed or you can keep closing those stones up and make fine flour that's how it works so we've been experimenting a little bit and i backed the stones off and cracked some wheat coarse like grits and we cook that in the morning for breakfast and sweeten it with some of our sorghum or some of permapasture's honey. It's it's our favorite. It's our favorite breakfast food. And you feel so good after you eat it. You can literally feel how good and what it's doing for your system. And it's just, it's it's crazy. It's amazing. After, uh, after you and I got off the phone earlier this week, I, I started telling my wife what you were doing. And she's like, I've seen that look in your eye before. She's like, you, you need to, you got so many things you want to do. <laughs> I said, I'm really excited. I want to put a mill on the property like right now. And she's like, no, nah, I just, just hold on. <laughs> I don't even have any I green, but I got a mill out front. You know, it's, that's. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> well, I'm excited to, to learn more about what you're doing and to follow your progress. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping at some point in the future, Lord willing, that we're able to maybe collaborate on, on putting one out here. At, you know, again, we'll, we'll have to see what the future holds. There's the world's a crazy place right now, but I think the community is important. So where can people find you? Are you, are you only on YouTube? What else have you got going on? I've got a page on Instagram. Uh, some, some folks send me a message there. It's Metcalf meals. Uh, that's YouTube's probably the best. I've got a lot of my contact info in the descriptions and, that's a really good place to get in touch with me. All right, guys. Well, you heard it. If you are interested in helping out, the Kickstarter is going to be in the description. So go ahead and find that. Uh, he said it's going to be up for two weeks, but this is obviously going to be delayed a little bit getting out. So it'll probably be up for about a week, week and a half more. But I'm sure you could contact him and, and give him money if for some reason that you're finding this video long into the future. Um, I'm sure he won't turn down donations. Uh, thank you very much for your time this morning, sir. I appreciate it. I look forward with, uh, with interest as to what you're doing and, and how it progresses and the final product and what you got going on. Thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate everybody out there that's helped and everybody that's helped me along the way. I just thank you so much. And also Leah, I think Leah down in Texas contacted you about getting with me so thank you Leah. she did she's she was one of the one of the eight or nine that that she's uh for those of you that haven't seen leah in the chat she's one of the most encouraging people i think that graces the chats and comments and and everything is positive so you're a blessing to a whole bunch of people yeah. leah thank you <laughs> yeah all right sir we will talk again in the future thank you shush